In the previous tutorial, I looked at the creation of the core particle effects in terms of its primary behavior and appearance. Go check that out if you haven't already. In this tutorial, I'll be taking things a step further, looking at how I created the interaction with the instruments. Let's start off with this shot, which features a guitar thing, a flat guitar. Is it a zither? What even is a zither? Zither? Let's just agree that it makes noises. What, do I look like a musician? Okay, so I've got a couple of points here, one to track the general movement of the shot, and one to track the movement of the musician's hand. You can see them here working together. It's a relatively simple shot in terms of movement, so I didn't really need to do much more tracking than this. The particle simulator layer was parented to the background track. This ensures that as the shot moves, the entire particle layer moves with it. In the previous tutorial, I showed how to use a cube emitter to create particles over a large area. For this shot, the emitter was a point emitter, which was parented to the hand track. So, as the musician's hand moves around, the emitter keeps pace. A couple of planes were added and positioned in 3D space to represent the surface of the instrument, whatever it's called. As you can see, their placement was fairly loose, but for this shot, they didn't need to be completely accurate. Don't forget with visual effects, you're just creating the illusion of something happening. You don't actually have to simulate reality. Deflectors were then added to the particle simulator and linked to the planes. The forces were approximately the same as in part one of this tutorial, a combination of a direction force for gravity and a turbulence force to create the random movement of the dust. The great thing about using forces and deflectors is that once you've got them set up, you can continue tweaking your particle effect and everything will be updated to work with the deflectors and forces. For all of these shots, there were two properties that were manually keyframed and which added hugely to the overall look. Firstly, in the particle system's general group, there's the particles per second property. Note that you have to go into the particle system itself's general group. The emitter general group and the layer general group have different properties. This property affects how many particles are created each second. By keyframing this property, you can then create some nice effects. For example, in this shot, I wanted it to look like the friction between the strings and the musician's hand was generating the sparks. If the particles were pumping out at a constant rate, it just didn't look right. You can see here, it just looks like he's got a particle hose attached to his finger, rather than his finger actually causing the particles. So if I switch keyframing on, I can then go through the shot, gradually adjusting the number of particles being created based on the movement of the musician's hand. So when his hand moves more, I ramp up the number of particles, as in stick it way up to a thousand or above. But then I'll drop it down again when his hand pauses or slows down. This way it looks like there's a direct relationship between the movement of the musician's hand and the particle creation, which for the viewer is an inherently exciting thing to see. It makes the particles reactive, which in turn makes them feel more real. That's often the key to any visual effects shot. If you can get a fully CG element to appear to interact with the physical part of your shot, the audience will probably buy it, even when it's something as abstract as these particles in this shot. Okay, next up, I'm gonna look at the velocity from emitter property. To do this, let's jump into a new composite shot as it will be easier to see what's going on. Okay, so here I've got a particle simulator and a 3D point. The emitter I've parented to the 3D point and then I've moved it off to the left. This means that when I rotate the point, the emitter goes round in a neat circle. As you can see, I've also set it up so that each particle is a completely different colour, which makes it easier to see exactly what's going on. Currently, I've got the particle movement set to 100. As you can see, particles are spawned and then move away from their original position, as you'd expect. Increasing the particle speed makes them fly off faster. Reducing the particle speed therefore does the opposite, with particles staying closer to their original positions. Naturally, if I put the speed all the way down to zero, you end up with a solid curved line. This is because each particle is spawned and then stays in that exact spot. Incidentally, this can be an interesting technique for drawing lines and shapes using the particle system. Right, let's take a look at the velocity from emitter property. Watch what the particles do as I increase it. It's not immediately obvious, but what's happening is that the particles are inheriting some of their movement from the emitter itself. In this case, with the emitter going round in a circle, it means that the particles get spun off into space. The particles are inheriting inertia from the emitter's movement. Try saying that ten times fast. Okay, flicking back to our main shot, 
If we add the velocity of emitter property to these particles, it's fantastic because it then looks as if the sparks are being pushed in the same direction as the musician's hand, again adding to the impression of interaction. Perhaps the best thing about using velocity from emitter is that you can have reactive particles moving in specific directions based on a single animated point, in this case the emitter. It's much, much easier, faster and more procedural than, for example, setting up a cone trajectory and then manually adjusting the particle's direction over time. There's one more detail that really helped with this shot, and it's quite an interesting technique. Looking at this version of the shot, the behaviour is all locked in, but the particles are simply stuck on top of the video, whereas we need them to be underneath the musician's hand. So the simple option is to duplicate the video layer, move the duplicate up to the top of the timeline, and then create a rotoscoped mask around the hand. So you can see here that I'm drawing a pretty rough mask around the hand shape. And once that's all done and closed off, it leaves only the hand visible on that top layer. I'll just skip to one I made earlier, because rotoscoping doesn't make for scintillating viewing. In a lot of shots this would work fine, that would be all you have to do. The complication with this particular shot is that some of the particles still need to be in front of the hand as well, due to their agitated movement. So although they originate underneath his finger, some of them then spew off into the foreground. This is where HitFilm's 3D workspace becomes super useful. I'm going to take our duplicated and masked layer and turn it into a 3D layer. I can now move this masked element through the particle field in proper 3D. In this case I'll move it a little closer to the camera so that it obscures most of the particles until they come flying towards the camera. Because I've moved the layer closer to the camera, it's now visually larger in frame due to perspective. I'll use the scale property to shrink it smaller than its full size, which will then match it up with the 2D background layer again. You can see how it works if I switch to the perspective view. It's a bit of an illusion, but it works remarkably well, and it's massively simpler than having to do more complex masking, or maybe splitting the particle simulator into multiple layers and faffing about that way. These techniques were all put to use again in the base plucking shot, which sounds ruder than it actually is. Once again we had two points, one providing reference for the camera movement, and another tracking the musician's plucking finger, which sounds ruder than it actually is. As mentioned earlier, Using velocity from emitter can make things really easy, once you've got your particle simulation set up correctly. Using essentially the same settings as the previous shot, but instead linking this emitter to the sudden, sharp movements of the musician's finger, the movement of the particles occurs procedurally and automatically, without much customization required. Again, I keyframe the particles per second so that they only spawned when the string was plucked. Because the string plucking is so short, each pluck consisted of three keyframes. Zero, then ramped up to 30,000, then back to zero. This creates a sudden, sharp explosion of sparks in time with the plucking, which sounds ruder than it is. The same 3D masking technique was used here, enabling the sparks to originate underneath the musician's fingers, and then spread out and curl around into the foreground, closer towards the camera. The shot of the drums had an extra challenge, and that the cymbals were moving each time they were struck. Because we don't have circular deflectors, for the main cymbal I actually used four separate planes and parented them together to form a larger shape. The planes were positioned in 3D and then hand animated to match the movement of the cymbals. It's a little bit fiddly, but as you can see it didn't actually require too many keyframes. The path of the drum brush was also hand tracked, because it's moving far too fast and disappearing in and out of frame for a computer to track automatically and the particle emitter was then linked to it. As you've seen, the birth of the particles in the previous shots was keyframed by hand. For this shot, I wanted to go for something different and even more procedural. Therefore, there are actually two sets of particles. First, there's a continual stream of streaks coming off the moving drum brush itself. These are actually created by a mobile emitter, and whenever those particles collide with the symbol deflectors, they then generate a second set of larger spark particles. We've covered mobile emitters in previous tutorials, so check out the links on screen. This results in rivers of glowing embers as the mobile emitter skitters over the surfaces. The number of mobile emitter particles hitting the deflectors will determine the number of sparks being created as a result, which creates a natural, chaotic appearance. Compare the spread out appearance of the sparks on the left of shot here, for example, to the intense tendrils on the lower symbols. Because the appearance of the particles is based around behaviour rules, rather than keyframing, the result is dynamic and exciting and movement-driven, 
It's also far, far more complex than anything that could be animated by hand. Even I don't know exactly what's going to happen, and I designed the shot. So, there are some additional ways of using forces and deflectors to create more interesting particle shots in HitFilm 2 Ultimate. There's so much more the particle simulator can do, it always feels like we're barely scratching the surface, but that at least means we have lots more tutorials to make in the future. I'm Simon Jones, and thank you for watching.